This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free. Connection. That's what the We're in Hell Foundation is all about. Over the last 20 years, our charitable work has built connections across the world. Connections between cultures, between communities, between powerful individuals in every level of your government and shadow cabals, but most of all, between people. However, the last two months have been the hardest that the We're in Hell Foundation has ever had to face. Despite the best of intentions, a recent political scandal has resulted in our Foundation's mission, reputation, and deep involvement in a so-called cult who worships the sea, all being called into question. To our staff, stakeholder, and you, our fans, we wish to sincerely apologize that partisan politicians and journalists have decided to direct their completely unwarranted scrutiny towards our philanthropic organization with absolutely no regard for the effect that their so-called questions and concerns could have on our work providing structural adjustment policies to countries in need. Truly a sad sign of the polarized times we find ourselves in. Neither the We're in Hell Foundation nor our founder Louis Seifer have ever claimed under oath to be perfect. Over the past 10 years, we've had our share of growing pains and mistakes, but like the noble shark, we keep moving forward. For example, while the press has claimed that Lewis bit a man in a ritual, they failed to explain why this supposed victim had worked for a foundation for several years if he had such a problem with the founder's religion. Nor have they mentioned that prior to working for us, he had cheated on his wife. For Lewis's part, under the guidance of his fellow apostles of the jaw, he's holding space for unlearning difficult accountabilities. However, because of this kind of blatant punching down, Lewis has made the difficult decision to end our current charitable activities to redirect resources to completing what he referred to only as the Great Connection. I'll always look back at the time I've spent serving the We're in Hell Foundation as the best years of my life. And I just think that it's sad to see so much time, so much planning, to have so much power finally within our grasp, only to lose it all. It's a sad reality that when you break the mold, you often wind up painting a target on your back as well. <laughs> But in all seriousness, it really was disappointing to see politicians and the media turn on us just because their puny minds couldn't comprehend the unrivaled effectiveness of a charitable foundation partnered with the secretive occult forces sponsoring this video, Surfshark VPN. The liberal elite in Ottawa will say that it couldn't be done, but behold, by combining their eldritch sorcery with our unwavering faith in the free market, we were able to harness their powers, allowing us to create private internet connections, whether at home or on the go, shielding our online activities from hackers, trackers, and our accursed ISP. What's more, if, like all too many of us these days, you find yourself fleeing the country to avoid trumped up charges fabricated by those who simply fear your power, then something you may not know is that lots of hotels change their prices based on where you are when you book your room. Using Surfshark, you can change your location to the place that you're traveling to and save on your stay. Surfshark is also the only premium VPN whose shadowy tentacles extend into and have servers in over 100 countries. But the media is trying to push a narrative that we're trifling with forces beyond our comprehension and it's like, no, we can control them. <laughs> And to prove it, Surfshark is offering their blessing to members of our foundation for 83% off for two years, plus an additional three months for free. So click the link in the description, go to surfshark.deal slash we're in hell, or use the promo code we're in hell, all one word, no apostrophe, at checkout to serve Surfshark VPN while supporting our foundation while you're at it. You guys wanna see something weird? Welcome. Man, came a long way. Now, I know Cribs typically is in West Palm Beach, Malibu. Welcome to Cribs East Africa style. 
So this guy who looks like a lacrosse player who had to change schools because a pledge died in a hazing ritual is Craig Kielberger. I've been covering him and the charity that he founded for my last two videos now, but as a quick catch up, when he was 12, Craig founded the charity Free the Children with his older brother Mark, later renamed to We the charity that is, not his brother, in order to fight child labor. And I don't mean that he got his classmates to sign a petition or something. While it may have started there, within a year or so, Free the Children became a full-on international development charity. This would be like if a kid started a lemonade stand and by the end of the summer was gentrifying neighborhoods and pushing mom and pop stores out of business. We Charity became massive, and the Kielberger brothers became stars. In the poorer countries where they operate, they build schools, hospitals, and infrastructure. While they do receive lots of corporate donations, a large amount of their money comes from the volunteer work of kids in Canada and later in the US and the UK. In 2008, they also started a social enterprise called Me to We, which sells clothes and volunteer trips where kids would volunteer in poorer countries, which we're just gonna stick a big old pin in and come back to later. All this is done at a profit, most of which Me to We then donates to We, to date totaling around $20 million. We does also buy a lot of stuff from Me to We, and so while We does still come out ahead, uh, from 2015 to 2020, the actual number was 1.3 million, which is nowhere near as high as the number on their website, but it is also probably more than you donated in that time. You selfish pigs! We also did all sorts of domestic work. The two big ones were We Days, massive events that acted as incentives for kids who did volunteer work, and We Schools, a program where they'd provide schools with teaching aids and curriculums, along with a host of just about every youth program you can think of, from ones aimed at teaching kids to recycle batteries to anti-bullying and mental health awareness. But then, in 2020, things came crashing down. The Liberal government awarded them the contract to administer a massive government program meant to help young people affected by the pandemic without making we compete with any other charities or disclosing that Trudeau's family had been paid to work for the charity, resulting in Justin Trudeau being investigated for a conflict of interest. Again. An ethics commission did clear Trudeau of any wrongdoing, and then a second commission was established to investigate further. That investigation ended, however, when Trudeau shut down the government, a very normal thing that the prime minister is allowed to do. The attention from the scandal resulted in the charity being placed under far more criticism than it previously had. Suddenly, people were saying things like, man, this children's charity sure has a massive real estate portfolio. Or, hey, isn't it weird how that anti-bullying campaign was sponsored by Hershey's, a company that uses child slaves? And even, I used, I used to work, work for We Charity, charity and, and the way they treat, treat their workers is horrible. horrible. And so, as a result of this criticism, as well as the pandemic causing especially lean times in the massive arena shows and volunteer travel industries, in September 2020, the Kielbergers announced that they were ending all operations in Canada. I talked about all of this in much more detail in my video from two months ago, and then again in my last one, which I made after we personally contacted me using my private email address. Still not sure how they got that. Uh, they pointedly brought up the multiple defamation suits that they're currently pursuing, told me that there were dozens of errors in my video, and that I was causing direct harm to their organization. In my opinion, a lot of their corrections were pretty granular and strange, but there were also quite a few things that I did straight up get wrong. I go over all of those in my last video, but there's also one more mistake that they've pointed out, which was that in a tweet that I've now taken down, I said that their lawyers were contacting me. Now, they're right that I was not correct, and nowhere in that email does it say that it's from a lawyer. In my defense, I got a strongly worded email from some very powerful people that mentioned ongoing lawsuits that they're pursuing and personal information that they had gathered about me. 
my incorrect assumption was that this was a legal threat. And so I talked to a lawyer who basically said, yeah, do whatever they tell you because you definitely can't afford to go to court against them. In reality, that email was written by the executive director of WE, Scott Baker, who I definitely shouldn't have said was a lawyer, in no small part because, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like these emails have been looked over by a lawyer, a communications department, or judging by the many, many typos, even just a proofreader. <laughs> This guy Scott, who, by the way, <laughs> I think one of the things I did that pissed him off, and I genuinely wasn't trying to be rude here, was that in all of his emails, he addressed me as Mr. <laughs> but I just kept calling him Scott. I'm sorry if that was unprofessional of me. I've never had an office job. If YouTube doesn't work out, I'm just going right back to wine cooking. But yeah, Scotty here has been taking time out of his schedule, which I guess is a lot freer now that we stopped operating in Canada, to send me very angry and sometimes just wild emails, sometimes as late as 4 a.m. I've been in contact with Scott while writing this video and have submitted this script to him prior to releasing it. He also suggested that I read the book What We Lost, written by a former board member of We, something I've done. Uh, one interesting point I've noticed is that while the book is extremely supportive of Wii, there is one criticism that seems to come up a few times. I think it's most succinctly put here. It's worth noting that sometimes Wii took a bad situation and made it worse. The Kielbergers often felt compelled to combat any error with a full-throated defense. Over the years, many board members, including me, had questions whether it was counterproductive to respond in such an aggressive manner. On reflection, however, I wish we had sometimes urged restraint more strongly, instead of putting out the fire we occasionally poured gasoline on it. I, know, I just think that's an interesting quote to keep in mind as we go over the notes that Scott made about this video. For one thing, in my last video, I got my friend CJ the X to read the notes that Scott sent me. For anyone who's never watched any of CJ's videos, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Other than, I assume, working as the executive director of Wee Charity. Anyway, here's what Scott said regarding CJ's performance. In your last video where corrections were issued, you mockingly presented our responses to your audience as if we were yelling the answers in a funny voice. However, those who criticized We Charity as your sources, including the academics you quoted, were presented in a normal voice and in a factual manner. Why is that? Now, look, I don't want to make this into a big issue, but I didn't give CJ any notes. They just read the lines how they wanted to and in more or less the same way they talk in their videos. Also, I've hung out with CJ and that is more or less just what they're like. They're just a very, very intense person. <laughs> Apparently, We Charity is upset that CJ was being themselves. But that just makes what I'm about to say so much harder. As you probably noticed, CJ is not reading Scott's lines in this video. In order to avoid any conflicts, CJ, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to let you go. Please take down your channel by the end of the day. Sure. I'm glad they're taking it so well. I got the YouTuber Ro Ramden to replace CJ, as she will replace all of us someday soon. Hello and welcome back to We Are In Hell, Community Theater's answer to Tosh.0. I'm a gay parasite that infected your usual reader via brain-eating amoeba. We're so glad to have you here. Just make sure to keep all of your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times and keep your shoes on when you use my bathroom because you might get tetanus. I'll be taking over from CJ reading quotes from the Wee Charity and look forward to delivering them at a calm cadence that lands somewhere between NPR hosts talking about the Ukraine and a single dad trying to coax his nine-year-old son into getting his hand out of the garbage disposal. I hate how much younger you are than me so much. Anyways, in the interest of fairness, Ro is going to be reading any quotes from Scott in a nice, calming voice. Any quotes from the Kielbergers will be read by Lance from the Surfs in a cool, sexy voice. And I've instructed everyone reading a quote from any academic to do so in a silly voice that makes them sound dumb. So look forward to that. Scott has also taken issue with the fact that I said that I would be critiquing the entire charity sector, and yet I've 
pretty much mostly just talked about we, something that he has characterized as an example of me lying, and has also insinuated that I'm only going after them for clout, which is fucking crazy. Like, no one knows about we outside of Canada, and Outside of Canada is where the vast majority of my audience is. Like, covering them was a massive risk. If I was trying to get views here, this video would be about Mr. Beast. No, let me be very clear. The motivation behind this video, like with most things I do in life, is spite. In all seriousness though, the way that Scott has started talking to me is extremely consistent with how we goes after anyone who's critical of them, saying things like this. All right, we're getting into the first quote here, so I figure I should transition into my reader voice. <laughs> Remember, we're supposed to be confident, calm, and conscious. From the outset, it was your intention to target We Charity. If you are true to your word that you are really seeking to discuss the sector as a whole, I would think it only be fair to produce a video that profiles several charities, and ideally ones that engage in distinct purposes and are of various sizes and structures, and you do proper analysis of the sector if this is really your true intention. Otherwise, any commentary on the sector will be grossly misleading and frankly dishonest. You have shown a pattern of saying to us one thing and then doing another to your tens of thousands of followers. I realize you wish to grow your audience, grow your own brand, and make money off of your YouTube channel, but in this case, you are doing this in a manner which causes tangible harm to our organization and tens of thousands of resource-poor people we serve. So that's good. Now, to be fair, there is some truth there in that we is not unique or the worst actor in anything I'm going to be discussing here. However, I am going to be talking a lot about them still, in part because, as I established, it's funny and I don't like them very much, but mostly it's because with all the scrutiny that's been placed on them, they make kind of a uniquely perfect case study. I think that we would probably see a lot of the same issues in most charities if this amount of scrutiny was applied to them as well, but for better or worse, the We Charity is the one we've got to work with, so get used to talking about these freaks and settle in for what Please God, I hope will be my last video about this by first going through this incredibly cursed Cribs episode. I thought my heart was pure, I did exactly as I should. But I was wrong and I don't know if I can change my way. In the episode, which more or less functions as a commercial for Me to We trips as well as their clothing line, Craig shows off the facilities where volunteers stay in Kenya. Now, some might find it a bit odd for a charity and its founder to be featured on MTV Cribs, a show where rich celebrities show off their decadent lifestyles. Personally, I would agree. It's very weird for a bunch of reasons. For one thing, <laughs> In my opinion, Craig has a very strange vibe through all of this. Like, this guy looks like the villain in every 80s Swabs versus Snobs movie. Truth be told, I don't do all the cooking myself. We have a Maasai cook named Ratikan who helps us out. Hard to believe he had time to shoot this in between getting pranked by the nerd fraternity and losing a climactic ski competition to a chimpanzee. In fairness here, Craig's had a very strange life. He's a devout Catholic, he never had much of a childhood owing to traveling the world giving speeches since he was 12, and he's written that he fired his first employee before he went through his first break. He's also claimed to have never been drunk or high in his life out of fear of bringing shame to his organization. So whenever you read about some horrible thing that the We Charity has been accused of having done, just take a deep breath and remind yourself that at least Craig never did something truly unforgivable like hitting a joint. But with that context, his grown in a lab vibes make a lot more sense. 
much. So welcome to the central dining area, or as we call it, the mess tent. Phenomenal food after a long day of school building. Massa pizza, the local joint, it's phenomenal. It takes seven hours to deliver out here, of course, but hey, if it's not here in seven hours, it's free. What it kind of reminds me of is how, like everyone knows what dad jokes are, but dad jokes also have a deeply cursed relative, which is boss jokes. A classic boss joke is something like seeing someone carrying some food and going, oh great, <laughs> you got me lunch. That's the energy Craig brings to this video. And so in my opinion, it comes off as a bit weird when at the very beginning and end, we see the local Maasai people who live in that area interacting with a man who looks like he was evolutionarily designed to say, do you know who my father is? So I hope you enjoy your time at Bogani, but hey, we got work to do. So unless you're going to build a school, get out. As they say in Kiswahili, toke inje, toke inje, get out. Nope, don't like that. Although, to be fair here, this definitely isn't all on Craig. The editing is for sure very weird and also at times hilarious. Like, they do these slow motion replays at seemingly random times in the video. A sweet sounding 5.1 surround sound. And welcome to it, Masai Mara style. Our No Cribs episode will complete without the kitchen. Deodorants, mouthwash, pen sanitizer, malaria pills. Don't leave home without them in East Africa. Oh. Closet space. Okay, I'm a little biased on what I wear. And are just some truly amazing choices happening here. Anyways, after showing the mess tent and playing some sick beats. Craig stops by the kitchen and drinks some cow's blood, which is a very big part of Maasai cooking, but also it really doesn't look like he's enjoying himself drinking it. Mm. 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 Ow. Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah, me when I'm lying. And then for the next stop, Craig shows us the actual crib. So first of all, I like how the outside isn't even remotely similar to Kenyan architecture. Like they just fully made some cottage core shit, but also that place is obviously massive, right? To the point where it's stretching the definition of the word cottage. Something that's very strange is that Craig makes it so much weirder by instead calling it a hut. And on the second floor, See, these huts are deceiving the big. Yeah, almost like that's not a hut at all. And Scott said something similar when he described it. All structures were made from local materials. They were designed to provide safety and comfort, but were basic in nature. I feel like this building is like a fun Rorschach test where what you call it tells how rich you are. For example, Craig grew up extremely wealthy. Like I'm talking about he and his brother were able to start free the children while they were themselves children because their parents moved into another house and let them and their friends use their childhood home as an office levels of wealthy. And so for him, it's a hut. I don't know much about Scott, but I assume he's doing pretty well for himself though. So for him, it's basic in nature. And then for me, I'm 29, have never taken a vacation in my adult life. And the only other job I've had has been working in kitchens. So I'm just over here Googling the difference between a mansion and a manor. <laughs> I should note though that none of these huts exist anymore since at the start of the pandemic we turned all their facilities in Kenya into medical housing which seems like a pretty unambiguously good thing to do so good for them there. Anyways, Craig gives a tour of the hut showing off the bathroom, the balcony, the master bedroom. This is uh, mosquito nets that they use here. To be honest, it's more for decoration than function. Yeah man, the giraffe print kind of gave that away. Then we get to all the cars and motorcycles. First of all, I just like how much he looks like a Far Cry villain here. Maserati, Ferrari, eat your heart out. Here at Pagani, we have the green machine. But also, I was expecting him to say how they use that thing for something, but I'm not cutting anything out here. Here's what happens. The green machine. Bet you don't have this in your driveway. Let's check out a few of the other rides. 
that's it. Like, I'm sure that they do actually use it for stuff, but it's so funny how Craig's just like, check this out, bitches. Anyways. But the part of this episode that definitely comes off the worst is when Craig shows one of his favorite parts of the hut. So the stairway is one of my favorite features. Built entirely out of reclaimed wood, so no trees were cut down for this. You know, God, it's amazing what they managed to build in the absolute middle of nowhere Africa. So, in my opinion, that line seems extremely ignorant at best, and honestly just racist at worst. Like, first of all, I have a pretty hard time imagining him walking into a house somewhere in North America or Europe and saying the same thing. Like, wow, it's amazing that you were able to build stairs. Except I asked Scott about this and he said that actually, yes, that is exactly what Craig would do. I appreciate your views on the statement. However, please allow me to emphasize that the context matters greatly. The region is extremely remote. There were no roads at the time, and still today there are now only one dirt road, and no electricity or running water or other structures. The statement simply referred to that reality and the challenges that it presented when the facility was being built, in the same way that one might refer to the middle of nowhere Alberta in a remote region that similarly lacks such infrastructure. In addition, the context of the show matters. Craig certainly would have said in the middle of Narok County. However, most viewers of MTV Cribs likely would not be familiar with the region. It was filmed for a broad audience. So I have some thoughts on that. First of all, it is just amazing that apparently it's official wee lore that when Craig's in rural Alberta, or if he was trying to appeal to a broader audience, rural North America, and he sees some stairs, he's just like, wow, this hut is amazing. No, but like, even if it's true that he didn't mean it that way, that wouldn't make it okay since it's common for people other than Craig, I guess, to say stuff like that, not because a place is so remote, but because of racist stereotypes of Africans all being primitive, poverty-stricken, and not having access to modern technology. This is something that it seems safe to say that Craig knew since, according to Scott, the reason that Craig chose to say the middle of nowhere Africa was because he knew a lot of people in the audience think of Africa as a monolith and so decided it would be better to confirm their prejudices instead of correcting them. Like, I don't have a lot of faith in the effectiveness of activism that just seeks to raise awareness, but communicating that Africa isn't a country would have been the absolute least he could do. Instead, I'm sure that there were people who watched that segment and thought, this guy obviously knows what he's talking about, and then believed something shitty just a little bit more. Now this, this is East Africa. Just to be clear, as much as I may joke about how Craig looks like a proud boy with low self-esteem, I don't believe that he is some secret evil racist. I think that, just like me, he grew up in a colonialist white supremacist society and has internalized the prejudices that come with that. Or rather, that's what I used to think. I now believe that that's the case for everyone except for Craig Kielberger. As Scott explained to me, I would also add that having worked with Craig for 20 plus years, I would voice in the strongest terms that he is not a racist, and I could never imagine the word racist and Craig in the same breath. Even if you have a different interpretation of the context of the MTV Cribs comment, I believe that it's important to not present one line in isolation to a life's work. This would be irresponsible to do so and, as a result, defamatory. Since his middle school years, Craig has spent his life working with colleagues in the Global South who are among his closest friends. Collectively, he has lived and worked for years in the Global South, and he has dedicated his life to expanding global compassion and solidarity to communities. So first of all, it's very bold to say that you can't imagine the word racism and the name Craig in the same breath. Like, even if Craig Kielberger is 100% not racist, Craig is for sure in the top 50 most common names for racists. Like, it's right below Nigel and above Patricia. Also, I would love to see them prove that he isn't racist in court. Like, Your Honor, I'd like to call Craig's black friend, who will confirm that he gave my client an N-word pass. And like, 
I'm sorry that I've had to go over so much stuff here that feels like it should be completely basic. <laughs> this is starting to feel like a now this video from 2015, but do you see who I'm talking to here? I didn't plan to spend so much time on this. That Cribs video is over 10 years old, and while that doesn't excuse it, people can change and learn. When I asked Scott about that line, I was expecting to get a standard statement that you hear any time a corporation gets called out for racism, saying that Craig is making space for starting a dialogue that centers a conversation about shutting up and listening. But instead, I got this. I, I don't know. I just wonder if there's a chance that this kind of defensiveness might be in some way connected to the hostility that an anti-racist activist experienced while working at WE in 2020. I was given a new speech to read and immediately I was angry and this was coming from a panel primary, primarily of white women and men. So first and foremost, one of the words that left my mouth was, I don't know if you understand how oppressive that is. To take the personal stories of a black woman who experiences a different kind of discrimination, who has definitely experienced a different, has experienced racism on a different level, um, to take her words, water them down, and present her with a speech without her knowledge. I feel like the truth was to make sure that they were protecting themselves um, to not really be real. They just wanted to water it down. They wanted the speech to be more we. Um, I was asked to talk about cornrows and I was asked to talk about the Oscars and I was just like, are we talking about like what's really happening in Canada? Are we talking about systemic racism? Are we talking about the mental navigation of being a person of color? Are we talking about the incidences of, of being followed in stores constantly and carded and all of these these real things that were happening were completely erased. Uh, shortly after there was a town hall meeting in regards to some uh, articles that were written about the culture of fear and employee experience and founder Mark Kielberger was also there and we were asked to share if the articles aligned with our experiences and I put my hand up because I'm that person. And then I started and shared that some of the things within uh, this article really did resonate with me. I saw the culture affair. And one thing that I said was that so many people are having siloed conversations that they're so scared to talk to people in positions of power where true change can get implemented. And not one, not two, not three heads nodded, but the whole room was agreeing with me. And I believe that was a threatening thing. Um, and then the founder then stepped up from the wall and completely shut me down in an instant. It was like, no, we're done. We're not having this cut. Just very blunt, disregarded of anything that I said. Also, if it feels like I'm being too critical, remember that these people were in charge of writing school curriculums teaching 4.3 million kids across North America about how to get involved with activism. With all that said, and I'm genuinely not just saying this to avoid the strangest defamation suit possible, we is right that this one video of Craig or any scandals don't erase the good that Craig and the We Charity have done in the world, and while that certainly doesn't absolve them from criticisms either, I do honestly get where they're coming from with how a lot of that stuff feels minor when it's held up against the tens if not hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were made better because of this charity. We sent me some testimonials speaking to the work that they've done for me to refer to in this video. Awful kind of them. All three letters talk about the great work WE has done building schools, creating jobs, and providing access to education, clean water, and medicine. I'll link them in the description, but should also say that two of the letters are from people who worked with WE administering their projects, and one is from a woman who's now a spokesperson for them. So while I have no reason to believe that the people who wrote them are lying, they clearly aren't neutral sources either. Along with the testimonials, Scott added, You also seem to have an interest in quoting academics in your commentary on WE. Please see an academic study written by Dr. Jason Saul about the impact of me to WE tips on participants and communities. <laughs> Maybe I'm just imagining it, but it doesn't sound like he likes academics very much, right? 
I do, though. So I looked through this report by Dr. Jason Saul and his company Mission Measurement, which does say that Wii's been extremely effective in their work, that it's especially good that they combine their charity work with Me to Wii's for-profit volunteer trips, that they create jobs and bring a ton of money into the community. And then there's a very detailed breakdown of how people who went on these trips were positively impacted, showing most significantly that people who go are more likely to actively look for ways to improve their communities, students who took it were more confident discussing complex political issues, and people in corporate management showed improvements in leadership skills which were also noticed by their employers. One thing that I thought was a little weird though was that they also found that people who went on the trip were apparently seven times as likely to quote, be agents of positive change in their local and global communities. And that's a bit weird, right? Like, I'm interested to know how they quantify being a positive agent of change. So I tried to look and see how they were determining that, except the report doesn't include any discussion of methods, which for a supposed academic study is pretty unusual. Like, Scott's emails to me are better about citing sources than this paper. The report does mention two studies that Mission Measurement conducted for Wii, but doesn't include them or give any way of finding them. So I emailed Scott to tell him how this all seemed kind of weird and asked him about the studies, if they were peer reviewed or anything, and if he could send them to me. And he said, no. From your questions, it seems you may be doubting Mission Measurement's credibility. We find this troubling. Other than Jesse Brown, the founder and editor-in-chief of Canada Land, what is the basis for your commentary? Please keep in mind that our objective in engaging with them was to be able to confirm that we charity and me to we are delivering the benefits as each intended and, if needed, identify areas where programming could be improved. The intention was not to produce reports that could be published in an academic journal, so to suggest that they either needed to be peer-reviewed or provide a discussion of methodology is not appropriate and rather unfair. This is wild to me. If they were just for internal use, then fine, but they bring these studies up all the time as evidence of how great we is. I'd think they'd want people to see them. You're supposed to keep the studies that make you look bad in-house. You can release the ones that make you look good. Sorry if I'm mansplaining to we how to run a sketchy corporation here. But the basis for asking those questions is because we describe the report as an academic study. And you know what academic studies include? Methods, data, citations, and ideally they've also been approved by experts in the field. You know why I like to use academic sources in my videos? Because they include all of that, and so I don't have to take an author at their word. That's the whole point. It sucks too, since like, I do genuinely believe that we has done good work and drastically improved a lot of lives, but interacting with them, it's unbelievably frustrating how they'll claim that they believe in taking responsibility for the mistakes that they've made while also refusing to be held to the most basic standards of criticism. So yeah, bear in mind that we has done a lot of good too. Now, with all that in mind, let's dig into volunteerism and the developments that led to Craig Kielberger making that facility out in the middle of nowhere Africa. Voluntourism is the practice of volunteers who are usually young, well-off Westerners traveling to lend a hand in remote and impoverished parts of the world. Its most vocal advocates tend to be white dudes whose favorite party trick is making everyone be quiet and watch them play Kendrick off of their phone and rap along including the n-words, which they insist that they can say because they spent a gap year volunteering at an orphanage in the middle of nowhere Africa. While, yes, that is just a description of something I saw happen once in university, I think that it's generalizable to the majority of people who take these trips, and if you want evidence of that, well, that's really not appropriate and rather unfair. Probably the most common place to spot volunteerists, though, is on dating apps. People with their favorite Lululemon tote bag quote as their bio, and pictures of them posing with a bunch of black or brown kids in a school with a dirt floor. Now, as far as more formal definitions, one foundational study on the topic by Weering in 2007 describes these people as tourists who 
undertake holidays that might involve aiding or alleviating the material poverty of some groups in society, the restoration of certain environments, or research into aspects of society or environment. Oh, yeah. Or from another study. The practice of individuals going on a working holiday, volunteering their labor for worthy causes. Voluntourism has been heavily criticized for a number of reasons. Several studies have found that these companies can often be dishonest about the impact that their work has. Also, the volunteer work that's usually done on these trips is generally just unpaid construction work, and it'd be better to have just hired local laborers, especially since most of the people going on these are teenagers who obviously aren't going to be very useful on a construction site. It's common to hear stories of kids going on these trips and then realizing that locals were going out at night to redo what they'd spent all day working on. And that's nowhere near the worst case scenario. A common voluntourist destination is volunteering in orphanages in Cambodia. The problem is that any business needs to grow, and so in order to fuel tourism, there need to be more and more orphanages. But while orphanages are cheap to build, easy to fund because they often operate for profit, plus they look amazing on a Tinder profile, they are also widely recognized as being terrible places for kids and should only ever be the absolute last possible resort. Not so in Cambodia though, since there's now all these orphanages that have been built by charities and pressure from the tourism industry to fill them. And so, yeah, the industry is, to say the very least, fraught. While I don't think that we has been involved in anything that bad, volunteer trips were a massive part of Me to Wee's operations, although they have been suspended since the start of the pandemic. A brochure handed out at Wee Day in 2010 advertised volunteer adventures in Kenya, where visitors would experience an intimate and unique learning experience against the backdrop of the African landscape. All the while you enjoy the comforts of home at Bogani cottages and tented camp. Come with us and feel the real heartbeat of Kenya as you meet the people, see the animals, and live the lifestyle. The brochure advertised luxury accommodations and healthy meals made by Wee's five-star chefs included in said lifestyle that visitors would be living. Hey, so I sent Scott a rough draft of this script and he sent me some corrections. Um, I assume that he'll want to release a full, more comprehensive statement, which I will link below. Scott wanted this point to be corrected. He wrote, if you have seen the meals yourself in Kenya at our former lodge, or have heard who the five-star chefs are, please let me know, because this is factually incorrect. We ask this change be reflected. So the line about five-star chefs, as well as all the other claims I've made here, are based off of quotes from the brochure that I mentioned. I have not personally been able to get my hands on that brochure, but it is quoted in an article by David Jeffress titled, The Me to We Social Enterprise, Global Education as Lifestyle Brand. In it, he wrote, quote, the all-inclusive trips ensure the compassionate consumer luxurious accommodation and healthy meals made from organic ingredients prepared by, quote, our five-star chef after, quote, a hard day's work volunteering. It goes on, a typical trip includes five days at the cottages learning about Maasai culture and working with a FTC, that's Free the Children Project, in a nearby community, followed by three days on safari or at a beach resort. But while one might think that that meets the definition of voluntourism laid out above, Scott was very adamant that it didn't, saying, we do not offer volunteerism travel. We provide culturally immersive travel. There is a big difference. Prior to COVID, when these travel experiences were provided, hundreds of individuals in the Global South were employed. The leadership in the Global South designed the schedule for guests. The purpose of our trips is not for people to simply volunteer in developing countries. Travelers are instead welcomed into communities in the Global South in the spirit of partnership and learning among each other. The volunteer work is only a portion of the trip schedule, which includes learning about global development issues and education about the vibrant and proud culture in the communities. 
Finally, the reason we have been able to build, for example, a hospital, a maternity ward, two high schools, a college, and hundreds of schools in Kenya is largely because of the generosity of donors who have come to the communities on these cultural trips and then made financial pledges to support the basic needs of these communities. This is done in partnership with the communities themselves. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been positively changed because of this form of partnership between travelers and community members. So, I don't think that any companies specifically advertise themselves as voluntourism. They instead offer a bunch of buzzwords about working with local communities, cultural immersion, and sustainable development, kind of like how we does. That doesn't mean that we was a bad actor here, but just that pretty much all companies basically say the same thing. We are nothing like those horrible voluntourism companies. What we does is offer opportunities to synergize tourism and volunteering. I said this to Scott and asked him to explain what he thinks voluntourism is and why specifically we is different. And he replied, whether a company uses the word voluntourism or any other to describe it is more or less irrelevant. You will need to examine the actual activities, such as the programs and the itinerary, to see what elements are included in the experience. Yeah, that's my point. There are certainly many companies and organizations where volunteering is the primary focus of the experience and is what the participants are paying to do. Habitat for Humanity, as an example, runs international trips where participants spend the vast majority of time building houses in places like Mexico. Such trips are also paid experiences. As Habitat for Humanity is among the largest providers of such volunteer trips, I assume you will be profiling them in your video. Here's the link to their website. On me to we trips, volunteering is only a small element of the itinerary. Rather, the activities are intended to provide participants with meaningful opportunities to learn about the communities they are visiting and engage in cultural understanding alongside the community members in a genuine manner. For example, Day in the Life activities, whereby participants have the opportunity to meet with community members in various contexts to learn about their lives, and with that, the issues they and the wider community face. These activities include attending home visits, assemblies at one of these secondary schools, and meetings with the women's and men's groups. It is because of We Charity's long-standing relationships with these communities that trip participants have such opportunities to engage with them. This is something that makes Me to We's trips vastly different from those offered by other organizations, and why culturally immersive travel is always a more fitting description. In conjunction with the above activities, Me to We trip itineraries also always include workshops and discussion focused on the activities of the day to give participants the opportunity to reflect on what they have experienced and link it back to the broader issues, including the impact of our actions in the global north that many donors will make substantial contributions to support projects and programming in the communities that they visit reflects the level of engagement and immersion that they experience. As you can imagine, they make contributions because of the time they spend with the people who live in the area, not because of the time they might spend volunteering on a construction site. I sincerely appreciate that there is also a meaningful discussion to be had about the various types of trip experiences that are often grouped under the term voluntourism. However, as I said with We Charity, it is not fair to inaccurately portray me to we for the sake of appearing critical of the entire sector, which is also diverse. So it sounds to me like, for Scott, the distinction between voluntourism and culturally immersive travel is that with voluntourism, they only spend their time volunteering. That's not really in line at all with any other definition that I've seen, and I just don't think that that's a particularly important distinction. Like, the problems with voluntourism aren't that visitors aren't interacting with locals enough. Also, no, I don't have any plans to go after Habitat for Humanity in this video, uh, although I will say that like we, they do not require volunteers to have any skills or experience in construction, and I will absolutely say that I don't think that anyone watching this should travel to another country to pay to do a job that you have no experience in. Anyways, I think that the distinction between voluntourism and culturally immersive travel is a bit semantic, so I decided to just interview a couple people who've gone on wee trips, and I'll let you be the judge. Who are you? Do you want to just introduce yourself? Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ellie. I am Ellie Grant, if you want to Google me, and I'm someone who went on a we me to we trip in 2012. I went to Kenya. We had two weeks in Kenya, staying in the Maasai Mara in this village. We were told that we were there to build a school. I'm pretty sure we only 
built the school, which really just involved mixing concrete. Um, like if you can imagine like 16 year old girls with no upper body strength with these really heavy shovels and trying to like really dig in and mix concrete to pour, um, that's what we were doing. But I think that's also why we couldn't do more than four days is because we didn't have the physical um, capability to really do the type of labor that they were required. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we spent maybe four days building the school. Part, half of that time, each of those times was playing with the children in the schoolyard, taking photos with them, all that kind of crap. And then um, the rest of the time we were touring around. So we went on a safari, we went to this local church and doing their gospel. Um, we went to the health center that uh, three of the children had built. Um, yeah, it was a lot of touring around and not, not so much doing what we thought we were there to do. We also did a ton of leadership development. So our facilitators, um, they were wonderful. I will say they were great people. We really connected with them. They did a very good job of leading this trip of, um, you know, like teenage girls. Uh, but um, yeah, it was a lot of time spent like doing these sort of leadership talks and and, and activities and trying to strengthen our, um, yeah, ability and also our interest in um, helping to understand like global and economic development and then also how we can interact with each other and work together as a team, a lot of team building kind of stuff. Um, and for that, I also don't think that was necessarily a bad thing, but it was just not what I expected. And I, it was also interesting because the students do all the organizing for these trips. You do all the fundraising and like the, I think you have to do pledges and kind of getting things together. And then obviously a teacher has to sign up and actually fill out all the paperwork but they don't send the students. I don't remember the students getting an itinerary being like, this is what you're going to do. Like more than half of this time is going to be spent touring around working mm. on leadership activities. And then less of that time is being spent um, actually building a school because it, but it was, though it was marketed as building a school. So yeah, it was a kind of a strange um, yeah. Yeah, way to enter into the, the space. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to walk you through the first night and what I remember. We were driven to this compound it was like outside of Nairobi and we stayed there the first night. It was completely gated, guarded by security guards. Um, it was, I think from what I'm trying to remember, it was quite like, yeah, kind of more modern, like Western development, nice rooms, flushing toilets, mirrors, um, a like a dining hall area where you could sit and eat. And we were completely removed from the first night. So if we're going to talk about cultural immersion and actually experiencing uh, the culture, I the first night alone like sets the tone for um, that immersive experience. And this is just solely based on accommodation. When we went to um, the, the Mara and stayed in this community, uh, you're like, if you can imagine, yeah, this barren field, you can see these people's homes off in the distance, they're living with the land, they're mm -hmm. used to their routine and their lifestyle, and then these people drive in on these giant, um, what are those trucks called, like, the ones that can kind of, like, drive through water and over crazy hills and shit? I, I think I know what you're talking about. Here at Pagani, we have the green machine. The name is slipping my mind, but anyway, so yeah, we get there, and then we're staying in these almost, like, military tents. And there's a mess hall tent that's mm -hmm. set up and we weren't close to anybody's homes. Mm -hmm. We weren't sleeping, eating, washing, interacting in a way that, you know, the community members there would. And I could see that being problematic on, um, I could see being that immersed as problematic as, as well, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it can be intrusive. We were, we looked like aliens. It looked like, um, like man on the moon, like just completely removed from the actual community yeah it was a lot of just being toured around we weren't we weren't interacting we, they brought us to this yeah this church and it, it was really cool but i felt at that even at that age extremely uncomfortable this group of white teenage girls and their te like teacher and leader counterparts are like just sitting clapping along pretending that they're you know used to this sort of church um setting but yeah, I felt uncomfortable. I'm like, I feel like we are, they're putting on a performance for us and we're there and we're not actually talking to any of these people. Mm. Like we're, we're just hearing them sing, which was, it was cool, but it didn't allow me to ask any questions. I was 17, so I was like, I'm going to go to school. I was like, I'm going to be going here. I'm going to be volunteering with this school. I knew that before, like to build infrastructure for the school. I knew that before time. I wasn't there the whole time, but it was a really large part of the trip. The part that I remember the most, I guess it was a while ago, so it's foggy, but the part that was like most 
sticking in my brain that I feel like I spent the most time doing was volunteering, or at least a really large trip, at least half, at least half the trip was focused around volunteering in this little community, helping build some infrastructure around the school. So what I was doing there was a few things. There was some, in, some foundation that needed to be dug, so we were digging holes to build foundation, and we were also laying bricks to build a latrine, um, and also just like hanging out with the kids at the school. I was very much benefiting from what those trips do best, in my humble opinion, which is grant a lot more to the traveler or the volunteer than I was able to give, than I will ever be able to give, I took away. Because when I was helping dig a foundation, a few days later it rained. When I was helping lay bricks for this latrine, I'm sure they redid it. Because we're not, we're not like, architects, we're not like, bricklayers, and it seems like, oh, this simple task of just laying bricks. Why would you trust a bunch of 14 to 17 year olds to lay bricks for a latrine? And it was a very, like, it was a big moment for me to come to terms with that. Like, that was for me. That was 1,000% for me, and I was not for them. And that was a hard pill to swallow because I thought I was really helping. Anyways, then there was an element where we, really, like, right next to the school, there was this, like, essentially, I, don't, I guess I don't want to use the wrong terms, but it was like a hut. Like, she wasn't living in a home made of bricks or like a house, like she was living in a hut. And the hut was made, we made a big point of like saying this was made with like a mixture of dirt clay and like cow manure or goat manure. And we would, and we entered this person's home. Again, like I didn't really know what she was saying. There was, there was a language barrier. We would just take turns entering this small space into this person's home and like watch her make bread on her like stove made from like the same materials as her home. And then uh, I'm just so cringy saying this. Like, I, this is something I never talk about. And I, I don't share that I have this experience anymore because I, I, I feel deeply, I, feel, I do feel ashamed. I don't feel terribly proud of this experience. I learned a lot from it. I learned so much, especially when I look back in a critical lens. Um, but I don't like sharing this. This is a part that I don't like sharing. Um, after we exited this person's home, <laughs> we took turns um, putting, we put on like a plastic glove and we picked up some of the like clay manure mixture and like put it on her house. We weren't, she had a house. She didn't need us to smear more dirt. Uh, but like, like, me going there, like, I was like, like, no, I was like, this is this person's home. Like, you're experiencing this person's life. And I'm like, how is it good to be that person? Like, like, these people come from Canada that live in, like, giant houses and have education and all this infrastructure. And, like, how am I patronizing? Do you, do you, do you, do you don't feel patronized because they do have a relationship with me to be otherwise, like, why would we be in that situation? She must, she must benefit from us being there in some way in regards to the relationship she has with me to be. But man, I, I'm like, I'm like red right now. So I went to that poor woman's home <laughs> and rubbed the dirt on her wall. Um, I carried, a, we all carried a ton of water from the well back to this lady's home. Hope she can use all that water. And it was useful that we grabbed it for her. Um, I'm sure it was, maybe. A ton of people came to our site. So where we were staying, they had some people come and teach us Bollywood dancing and do henna and bring some scarves and goods and things and we could shop like on our little location. So again, that feels very curated. And then we went to the city of Udaipur for a day and like hung out in the markets and did some shopping and stuff and had like, I ate at a restaurant in the city and that was really nice. I just, that was, I guess that was pretty, that was like the culturally, that was one of the most culturally immersed because I was like, shopping. <laughs> We didn't talk about, like, the colonization of India, you know? That was never, we never really talked about their history. This community that didn't have access to education. This community that girls can't go to school because there's no latrine. So if, if there's no latrine, they're not in school once a week because there's nowhere for them to, like, deal with their period for that week. And they're looked down upon as disgusting and dirty. Like, it was very much like a focus on the culture. I guess we kind of talked about the caste system, but it's when it kind of, like, went back to, it goes back to the culture. They don't have access to to education because they're discriminated against as women in this culture, or there's poverty in this culture because of discrimination of the caste system. Like, we understand, like, they talk about those systems, but I don't think they ever really talk about colonialism. My, the cultural facilitator that I had become close with, like, he was the person who would give us the cultural context, and he was just a few years older than I was, so we ended up just becoming friends and chatting, and it was one day he was really frustrated and mad, and I kind of asked him what was bothering him, and he said that the previous night there was people there who were from the corporate trip, where they were like an older group of people, and they had cracked like a couple bottles of wine or something, or cracked, cracked a couple bottles of, I don't know, some, some bubbly, and I was really frustrated because if you're here to do work or like to make an impact in this community and you're cracking this bottle of alcohol that's worth more than someone's like yearly income in that community, like I really do think 
that they think they're doing really great work and that their cause is just even though they function in a broken system. I guess that's my biggest problem with Mutui is like they were they were made in a time that was much more insensitive, much less aware, in the peak of like neo-colonialism, and they were a part of like combating that and starting a new dialogue. And that's very admirable. Like the start of their story and their upcomings is admirable based on like the context of like the global community, but they've never learned or grown. They've never grown with the changing information. They never like themselves continue to progress and learn in a way that's more sensitive and less ignorant. So, hey, me again. So Scott wanted to add a response here. Uh, he wrote it in this way that's supposed to sound like I'm just naturally saying it, which I really fucking hate. Here we go. In fairness, tens of thousands of people traveled with me to we, and many had an extremely positive experience. The impact also helped shape future decisions, including what they would study in the future and making positive changes in reducing their consumption patterns and their ecological footprint on the world as a result of the trip. We provided a study from Dr. Jason Saul, who looked at the impact of its trips showing an overwhelming positive impact on those who had traveled. So just a small correction there, Scott actually specifically refused to send me that study. So um, I'm sure that's just a, a simple mistake on his part, probably got that mixed up. Stepping back a bit, the type of work that voluntourism is an extension of is called international development. So what that mean? Well, development is a really sneaky concept. Just Googling it, the Salvation Army's website defines it as, quote, the pursuit of a better world for all through the elimination of poverty, discrimination, and injustice. Damn, what kind of monster would oppose that? We should throw him in a cage and set him on fire, if you know what I mean. As a side note, I'd just like to say that joining my Patreon means hope understanding, rescuing cats stuck up in trees, and getting access to the music from my videos and your name in the credits. No, but that's not what development really means, like, obviously. The term was first used on January 20th, 1949 during the first televised American inaugural address. In it, Harry Truman said, We must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. More than half the people of the world are living in conditions approaching misery. Their food is inadequate. They are victims of disease. Their economic life is primitive and stagnant. Their poverty is a handicap and a threat both to them and to more prosperous areas. The material resources which we can afford to use for assistance of other peoples are limited. But our imponderable resources in technical knowledge are constantly growing and are inexhaustible. And in cooperation with other nations, we should foster capital investment in areas needing development. This was a last minute edition, but it fucking crushed. Not just in America, but also in European countries whose formal colonial reign was coming to an end. The idea behind development is basically that countries run on the same rules as historical strategy games, and any disparities are just because all those countries who just so happened to have been colonized didn't put enough points into their skill trees for no specific reason, don't worry about it. All that was needed to end poverty was for rich countries to help them catch up by teaching them about farming, medicine, and the free market. Mostly that last one, though. I promise we'll tell you all about modern irrigation techniques right after you guys prove that you understand basic economics. Now, for your next project, you'll be building a golden statue of Murray Rothbard. This was so effective because through this perspective, not only were imperial countries not responsible for the state of their former colonies, now they were the solution. And what did that solution look like? Well, what this development aid would often include would be a push for so-called developing countries to modernize their economies through free trade and austerity policies. Interestingly, that's actually not at all what so-called developed countries did. Most countries that are rich today got that way through policies that involved heavily investing in their welfare state and economic protectionism. 
The reason I bring this up is because I think that this flip in how Western countries came to understand their role in aid reveals two dynamics that we're going to see coming up again and again. On the one hand, we have the stripping away of all historical and structural causes of poverty, portraying starving kids in an unspecified part of Africa as victims without victimizers. On the other hand, aid, whether it be from individuals, organizations, or governments, is oriented to prioritize being enjoyable and profitable for those providing it over any concerns about the needs of the people they're supposedly helping. All right, let's fast forward a few decades now and talk about neoliberalism. Reagan, Thatcher, Milton Friedman, Frederick Hayek, we privatized the profits and socialized the losses, and now eggs cost $1,000 and everyone's running on fumes. That basically covers everything, but if you want a more detailed explanation of neoliberalism, check out just any of my videos. By the 90s, neoliberalism had gone from a radical fringe ideology to the world's dominant economic paradigm. Something that happened in North America during this period was that we saw the rise of bands that I like to sing at karaoke and a movement aimed at making capitalism an instrument for social justice through ethical consumption. The main form that this takes is what's called purchase-triggered philanthropy, which is when companies donate some of their profits to some charitable cause generally tied to an ad campaign. At the same time, as the government withdrew more and more, the state's just been staying home and really going goblin mode right now, but as the government shrank into a small little bean and took on less of a role in things like welfare and international development, there was simultaneously an explosion of non-profit organizations and non-government organizations. Soon, NGOs and NPOs came to take over some of the state's functions in welfare and development, respectively. But while these organizations are, by definition, not meant to be for making money, with government funds drying up, the charity sector came to rely more and more on private funds. Nonprofits have always worked closely with corporations looking to seem like they're making a difference. Corporations will hand over their advertising budget to a charity, and the nonprofit adds expertise and legitimacy to the project. But charities didn't just receive money from the private sector, they also got something that an endless stream of crypto bro turned motivational speakers on Instagram have taught me is far more valuable than money a business grind set. One very messed up example of this is a little charity that you might have heard of. That's right, World Vision. <laughs> While World Vision is probably best known for those old sponsor a child commercials where they'd film African kids with flies on their faces. I'm here in northern Zambia and I need your help. Why? I mean, just look at this water. But Despite the fact that they had a policy banning the hiring of gay people until 2014, World Vision's marketing has actually kept with the times, albeit in a shockingly cursed way. The World Vision gift catalog, which you can find on their website or as physical copies that they mail out, presents charitable donations as products laid out like any other online shopping experience. Except instead of spending 50 bucks on a 3-in-1 combo foot massager, squatty potty, and instapot, you can spend the same amount to buy some chickens for an impoverished community, like somewhere in the world. It actually doesn't say, like, on their site they show this video about the impact that chickens have, but don't tell you where it was filmed at all? Here was this couple who has four children, and I understand the love that parents have for their kids. This family had received chickens from World Vision, which is a great gift. The oldest ones didn't really get to benefit from a great education because the family didn't have the chickens at the time. A savior who is Christ the Lord. But whatever, so they have chickens for 50 bucks. Let's see what else. Oh, uh, for 65 you can buy help for sexually exploited girls. That feels gross, right? <laughs> like, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why depicting sexually abused children as products is beyond fuck. In a paper on this, Vincy Lee describes the World Vision gift catalog as an expression of philanthro-capitalism, the merger of business with charity. 
This is absolutely nothing new, but Lee points out that what is unprecedented is the scale at which it's taking place, and with that, how shamelessly its supporters will celebrate it for its profitability. The way this plays out is that charity is seen as good because of its profitability. Donations, then, are now an investment that drives innovation and develops infrastructure which can be used by major corporations. Thanks to your generosity, the child that you sponsor could grow up to be the next Satoshi Nakamoto or Elizabeth Holmes. You can see this in the World Vision gift catalog, not just in the little tags they put on products advertising multiply 6x impact, but also in how the first thing that you see when you load the page and on the first pages of the physical copies all have to do with animals. The reason they push this is because the recipients aren't meant to raise some livestock and live off of that themselves. They're given them to start a business. And to be clear here, you can make a good case for that being the most efficient and effective way to help people. My issue though is with who decides that and what their motivations are. Let's come back to Canada's favorite philanthropy boys now and talk some more about we. I'm sorry, I'm sick of having to write jokes about these guys who look like they're about to go on Tucker Carlson to argue that wealthy is the new n-word too. But Craig and Mark are very explicit that this blend of business and charity is what we is all about. The two brothers, along with Richard Branson's daughter Holly, wrote a book called We Economy that makes their stance very clear. And Craig has been hired to speak at events saying stuff like this. My name's Craig Kilberger. I'm the co-founder of the WE organization, and I appreciate you joining me today for a conversation on the power of purpose. Purpose is the differentiator. 75% of millennials would take a pay cut to work at a company that gives greater purpose. Let me tell you the story of Tanya Carnegie. She was a young accountant at the firm KPMG, one of the biggest accounting firms in the world. After a volunteer trip overseas to Africa, she came back and questioned whether her nine to five was equaling the social impact she wanted. She almost quit her job. But then she thought about it and realized that in her company, a company that had reach around the world, she could do more good. Issues like climate change, issues like global poverty or forced migration, issues like gender empowerment. The world's problems are innovations waiting to happen. That is what we're gonna talk about today, how business and charity aren't two opposites, but in fact, they're merging on this path together of social entrepreneurship you can achieve both purpose and profit in the process. Thanks so much for listening today. If you want more tips and ways to get involved, please check out the We Economy book. It is the blueprint for purpose and profit in the workplace. <laughs> I was going to write a joke about how these look like presentations for a sketchy crypto scam, but then looked it up and found this article that of course Craig wrote. Moving on, in a paper by Jessica Weirgu et al. Honestly, shout out to et al, unbelievably slept on writer. They argue that one of the key assumptions of philanthrocapitalism is that the market is a capable and appropriate medium for providing aid. The problem with this, though, is that there are certain values that are fine to expect from a market when we're just consuming regular things that aren't as great for distributing aid. The big one is choice. It's good that we can have a say and make choices when we're buying things normally, but not so much when it comes to charities. With the World Vision gift catalog, for instance, products are sorted by most popular, which makes sense in other kinds of online shopping, but the people donating to World Vision aren't experts. They don't know what's most needed. I don't care if 9 out of 10 Karens agree that kids in Ethiopia need horses. Until I hear it from someone in a lab coat, I'm not buying those kids a single fucking horse. <laughs> In a paper called Humanitarians of Tinder, Constructing Whiteness and Consuming the Other, Nisha Toomey analyzes the Facebook page Humanitarians of Tinder, where people submit pictures of white people just being gross. I'm just a Pam looking for her gym. I love staying active, Harry Potter, and being the savior of Africa. Asian swipe left. 
The paper is actually so much better than it has any right to be for how funny of a thing it's looking at. In it, Toomey writes, the notion of the individual being able to do what she pleases, so as long as she pays for it and there is specific consent, is central to the proliferation of volunteerism programs. Volunteerism programs that claim to work with fully consented individuals, groups, or communities actively shape geographies of who gets help and who does not, according to which markets better work and which representatives can better recruit travelers to them. No community members are viewed as passive subjects, their opinions are not considered nor asked for, and they become spectacles for the volunteers to observe. In the worst cases, the work of community organizations is seriously undermined by the presence of volunteers. The view that community desires and activities are somewhat besides the point to the volunteers' personal experiences symptomatic of an overall view of community members as items of consumption. So, bearing that in mind, a common critique of the practice of volunteerism is that it'd be a lot more effective if people just donated the money they'd spend on a trip directly to the people they're trying to help. So, why don't they? I think a good question to ask here as we look at this is what's gained by not doing that? In Lee's paper, she argues that in addition to purchase-triggered philanthropy, there's also what she calls consumption-oriented philanthropy. Things like the World Vision gift catalog, where unlike a campaign where you buy something and profits are donated to a charity, there's not really an obvious product, but instead the person receiving the aid becomes the product. When we donate in this way, what we're in a sense buying is the performance of gratitude from the recipient. In my opinion, this fits pretty well with the way that we presents their trips and activism as a whole in terms of the good it does for those volunteering, allowing them to find meaning, explore, not to mention impress colleagues and their bosses. In their book, Me to We, Craig and Mark lay out what they call the rich but poor phenomenon, the idea that while countries in the global north may be materially rich, they're spiritually poor, unlike the people in the global south who can teach us true happiness. What initially surprised us most in our travels to many poor countries of the developing world was not the misery or the extensive poverty, but the happiness and the hope that survived despite it. We saw not only the scenes of hunger and suffering, but also moments of community, compassion, trust, and laughter. These people have something valuable to teach us. Something that's like funny too is that they claim that they came up with this concept, which is absolutely not true, because this is actually a very common trope appearing in a lot of writing where indigenous people are portrayed as noble savages by their colonists. And so it's wild to want to claim that. <laughs> Mark and I came up with this cool new concept that we're calling the white man's burden. Hey, so Scott asked me to clarify a couple things here. First of all, he said that Mark and Craig never claimed to have invented that idea. Um, I had based that claim off of a couple of lines in their book, Me to We, Finding Meaning in a Material World, where they wrote, uh, quote, when we get caught up in the race to get ahead, taking time away from our spouses and our children, we risk falling victim to an overwhelming emptiness we call the rich but poor phenomenon. We coined this term a few years ago at the World Economic Forum. And then later in the same chapter, they write, despite their immense wealth, they, meaning the super rich, uh, cannot afford to spend even a day enjoying one of the most magnificent winter resorts in the world. This is how we discovered the rich but poor phenomenon, the tendency to live to work rather than work to live. So I guess that's my bad there. I shouldn't have assumed that when they said that they discovered something, that they meant that they had come up with it. Scott also said that this is not an example of the noble savage trope, saying, quote, the idea of the noble savage is different. The concept essentially refers to stereotypes of indigenous people and communities where they are idealized and portrayed as being frozen in the past and having moral superiority for being uncorrupted. He goes on to say that Craig and Mark were simply commenting on the, quote, resilience of people faced with adversity. So while admittedly Craig and Mark never use the phrases frozen in the past or uncorrupted, in my opinion, what they wrote comes off as at the very least adjacent to the idea of the noble savage. 
But the point here is that while volunteerism does for sure bring money into communities and helps the inhabitants by creating jobs and funding larger aid projects, the people in these communities are absolutely providing a service for the visitors. And so the key thing to be aware of here is that this is absolutely not a relationship between equals. But these trips do something more than just that. In Toomey's paper, she argues that the people who go on these trips are exposed to the horrors of global inequality, but in a context that prevents them from reflecting on their own involvement in the system that causes it. The reason why they're able to go on this expensive trip is because of the same economic and geopolitical order that robs the people they meet and take pictures with of the ability to travel in the same way. But I think that this really speaks to how the type of activism that we and lots of other organizations just like them advocate for is one that not only ignores ongoing historical and systemic issues, but actively works to prevent volunteers from engaging with those issues by presenting them through the lens of global capitalism. And speaking of, let's talk about some of Wee's corporate donors. We has, for instance, partnered with Dow Chemical with Craig sharing a stage with then CEO Andrew Laveris. Here, some exciting programs for your school, some exciting programs right here in Michigan. So they are a big deal here, but they're a big deal everywhere in how they help out. So please join me in giving a round of applause to the Chief Executive Officer of Dow. Andrew, please come on up here. A man who was also at that time head of Trump's American Manufacturing Council, where he was pressuring the Trump administration to ignore studies warning about the harms of the pesticides Dow was producing. Craig has been very outspokenly in favor of public-private partnerships, but I didn't think that this was what he meant there. So regarding Dow, Scott said, quote, I have included a high-level description of the programming Dow made possible. You continue to attack We Charity on the engagement of corporate donors, but fail to adequately share what kinds of programs they were doing with us and the value these programs create. The high-level description reads, the purpose of the partnership was to teach students in resource-poor high schools in Michigan State the purpose of STEM education. <laughs> Damn, that really was some high-level shit there. Anyway, the point is, next time you criticize we for working with the company responsible for the Bhopal disaster and the ongoing contamination in the area, just remember that they also teach high school students that STEM is important. Coming back to the question of why not just donate to these places instead of adding all the extra steps involved in volunteerism, the answer is that doing it this way is far more beneficial for everyone other than the people who are supposed to be the ones receiving aid. For the volunteers, they get an unforgettable vacation, a fire pick for Tinder, and something that looks great on a resume or college application. In fact, Craig is pretty clear about one of the target demographics of we economy being people at corporations looking for ways to stand out. For corporations, they benefit from good PR, or as we has referred to it when reaching out to potential sponsors, the halo effect. They also get potential access to new markets in the global south. And finally, they produce more people to hire with this kind of valuable experience. That's a very common reason why corporations support charities, by the way. Like, you know how tech companies love supporting programs that teach people how to code? That's to drive down the wages of programmers. As for the charities like we, when those people who've taken their trips go on to try to get their companies to make a difference through brand partnerships with an NGO, they're probably gonna suggest the one they took a trip with all those years ago. With all that said, I do want to close out by being fair to we here. I obviously have a lot of problems with how they operate, but I think that it is worth engaging with what I think is the steel man of their approach to charity, which is that from a strictly utilitarian, consequentialist view of things, they are helping people, and even with all the criticisms of them, they're still doing it on a scale that more grassroots organizations can't really do. When I asked Scott about this, I don't think that the answer he gave me was totally unfair.
There is no easy set of choices for a charity. For us, it is a matter of seeking to do the most good. We Charity conducts a rigorous and thorough vetting process to determine suitability of any partnership. In short, the charity has long utilized a numerical ranking system based on several factors. Corporate partnerships have helped us, like other charities, ensure financial efficiencies, secure sustainable funding to be able to deliver long-term programming that are critical to empowering communities in situations of extreme poverty, and in Canada, ensure full accessibility of our programs to all stakeholders. Regardless regardless of socioeconomic factors. We Charity has only sought partnerships with companies whose behavior, on balance, demonstrates a willingness to exercise a high level of corporate social responsibility, and that demonstrates a commitment to and affinity with our charitable mandate. There are many companies that we have turned down without providing specific names. There were, for example, various resource extraction companies, oil and gas companies, and certain apparel companies that we declined affiliating ourselves with. Now, I do think that that is reasonable, although I will say that I am pretty skeptical about what that line is for who they will or won't work with. For example, while I think it's great that they've refused to partner with clothing manufacturers, they have also sold me to we merch in Walmart. Scott went on to say, I understand that you are looking to offer a critical commentary. However, if you are seeking to look at both sides of the matter, the impact of the work we did with our partner's financial support really cannot be ignored. Thanks to the support, over 200,000 students received an education, 30,000 women have alternative sources of income to escape poverty and provide for their families, and 1 million people have access to life-saving health care and clean water. We believe that it is important to listen to local voices in the Global South. Local leaders work with families who face the difference between life and death when a child gets access to health care and clean drinking water, and a young girl can escape early childhood marriage and FGM through opportunities with education. Leaders in the Global South often are the strongest advocates to partner with companies because that corporate support funds these essential programs. Lastly, it is easy to critique a charity for working with corporations. However, it is important to consider the other side of what this funding means for a charity's beneficiaries. We hope you are planning to offer some degree of balance in your future commentary. Carol Mora, who has worked with the WE charity for many years, overseeing community programming in Kenya, and previously serving as the principal of our all-girls secondary school, has commented on this in the past. She has noted that partnerships with corporations are literally what keeps our communities alive. Anyone seeking to impose a Western mindset on these issues and not recognize them for what they are, which is in essence a source of funding that would not otherwise be available, must consider the place of privilege that they are coming from. Coming back to our question about why do volunteerism instead of just directly donating to the people who you're trying to help, Wee's response would probably be that that would be great, but people aren't just going to donate without traveling to these areas, meeting these people, and seeing why it's important for them to do that. And I think that that's fair, but also speaks to the problem of treating charities as an individual action in this way. Like, this isn't a matter of making the most of a bad situation. This is a feature of the system that they champion. In the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, there's an essay talking about the charity Sista Sista, which had their funding placed in jeopardy after they tweeted their support for Palestinians. And they make a case for why charities should abandon foundations and take on a more grassroots model. And I think that they make a lot of good cases for how grassroots organizing is not the dead end that people tend to think it is and can be very effective and in fact has a lot of advantages. And I think that those arguments are true and make good points. But also, realistically, they could have helped a lot of people with the funding that they lost. And I do think that there's an important question about how much was that tweet about Palestinians really worth? And yeah, I don't really have an easy answer to that. I think that it is very clear that it's impossible to make systemic change while being dependent on people and organizations whose wealth and power depends on the system. For instance, Bill Gates's charity has done great work fighting disease in poorer countries, but also, a big part of the reason why diseases are so prevalent in those countries is because they can't afford medication and aren't allowed to use generic versions because of the intellectual property laws responsible for Bill Gates' wealth. 
With that said, while I do think that grassroots movements have a lot more potential than people like the Kilbergers like to believe, I'm not confident in them being able to cause systemic change either. And in the meantime, that corporate money does help a lot of people. Uh, I guess one place where I will agree with them is that there aren't easy answers to this. Although, I think that hopefully we can do better than these ghouls. Thanks for watching. The end of era buries me This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free.